today we're going to be talking about beer. Yes, you've got that right. We're going to be talking to Pedro Brewcrafters, one of the pioneers in the exciting craft beer industry in the Philippines. How did this company get started as a side hustle? Let's find out. Starting off today's vlog, and I wanted to introduce to you Mr. Jaime Fanlo. He's the founder and head brewer of uh, Pedro Brewcrafters. Pedro is one of my favorite local craft beers in the Philippines. So, welcome, Jaime. Thanks, man. Happy to be here. I'm honored to be your first guinea pig. <laughs> Thanks, Jaime, for joining me. Um, as I mentioned to you, I started going on YouTube and I shared my story on how I put up an Airbnb in Palawan and the theme was basically how I escaped my 9 to 5. And why I wanted to invite you here was uh, really because I know also that you're coming from an employment background before you started Pedro. So could you share more about the history of Pedro and maybe just first start where what you were doing actually before uh, this business? Okay, so... Uh, before Pedro, I was uh, practicing law. I was an in-house counsel for uh, a pretty large uh, multinational that, that had an office in Makati. And I'd been working with them, I think, for a good four or five years at that point. My background before beer was pretty much economics and law the whole time. <laughs> so I, I was always an employee up until that point where we decided to get into... Uh, the world of beer. You weren't, you weren't a cook, you weren't doing anything with your hands previously, so you were all, you know, uh, you were all text, literally textbook and uh, white collar type of work. Sorry, sorry for the term. Pretty much, yeah. Well, I graduated from law school 2007 and I uh, took the bar and passed it in 2008. Mm -hmm. So ever since then, you know, it was, it, it was pretty much law or stuff related to law that I was working on. Um, I went through maybe two or three jobs throughout. I was in a bank. Mm -hmm. I worked in a law firm and then I was in a U.S. national. What did you get into brewing? Mm -hmm. um, Pedro initially came as something that me and my wife had not planned. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the founders of uh, Pedro um, was one uh, classmate of mine in law school. So she's okay. a lawyer and an accountant also. She, she Jill. She Jill, uh, yeah. Um, she gave me a call one week and she said, hey, you know, um, I, I want to catch up with you guys. It's been a while. Let's go get some drinks. And uh, there's this business that I'm looking at getting into. Maybe you'd be interested. Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah, sure. So yeah. Um, met up in uh, Serendra uh -huh. in a bar there. We proceeded to catch up and we had seven or eight beers <laughs> into us uh, when we started talking about business and at that point when she said hey you know I want to put up a craft beer brewery mm -hmm. we, it was super easy sell for us we're like yeah. you know, we're feeling really happy right now sounds great yeah so in that meeting in Serendra were you into craft beer already or was it something that you know you were just getting started on our experience with it was mostly as consumers we had so we like we like the idea of having you know more flavors, more options. We thought it, it was something that the local market would just do well because we enjoyed it. We didn't know a whole lot about it at that point. Uh, one of the ingredients in beer is hops, right? You're familiar with that. Yes. Well, if someone told me hop back then, I would think it meant jumping up and down on one leg. <laughs> I, I, I had no idea. But mm -hmm. The next day, we sobered and we started looking at our business model. Mm -hmm. um, we tried to do a little bit of research and and look at the history of beer in the country and look at players that at that time were already in the market. And there were very few. there were yeah. there were five five or seven players at that time when we first mm -hmm. opened up. So and that, these were the, the, the OGs. Meron, but um, it was it was really at its infancy. It was just starting out. Mm -hmm. So um, these were guys like uh, Katipunan, Box Brew, Craft Point. Okay, okay. We started learning more about it, and I would say it took us maybe three, four months until we were confident. That time I was still working, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still working full time. So I would work, and then we would work on our business plan on the weekends or in the evening. Mm -hmm. 
when I could. And we managed to put some money together um, to be able to get uh, the equipment which we set up in San Pedro, Laguna. So our brewery in San Pedro was funded by that by that first round and, of... Uh, and that's the name, right? The Toyota Pedro because it's in San Pedro. Right, right. We've, we were like, okay, setting all this up. We have a consultant who's kind of getting us, you know, started. Mm-hmm. But we don't have any in-house knowledge on this, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we had one partner who had, um, had the background. My wife, Nadine, has a good background. But not really in, you know, uh, in craft. So then we ended up look for a uh, course and my course uh, had uh, some liberal arts units and I had chemistry, I had, I had all the requirements. Mm-hmm. But the end being me. Yeah. Thing, no? We had um, R&D trips, we went to beer festivals abroad. Mm-hmm. Uh, wow. Hong Kong, there was this festival called Beertopia. That's a fun right? way and to get started. We checked out the beers there. <laughs> yeah, of, of course. You have to check out <laughs> the market and how people respond to it and what's popular. We got someone who helped us with setting up the brewery, designing mm-hmm. the brewery. So we did have a consultant for that. Mm-hmm. And initially, some of our home brews, when we started uh, practicing at home, he kind of helped us out with. But mm-hmm. then it was about a year to get our work done for me to pass uh, a course to the U.S. And then it was operational August of 2015. And I think we put out our first commercial sized brew in September of 2015. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned that uh, you you were going to these festivals and you actually had to train abroad. So at this time, did you already leave your job or was it, were you going on leaves? M- most of my, most of my legal work um, was for the region and or the US. So okay. as long as I could make the trips that I needed to make for my work, mm-hmm. then I was okay. My vacation days ended up being my, my brewing course. So I, uh, I ended up okay. saving all my vacation days to be able to take the to be able to take the brewing course. Um, it was a six month course. So wow. uh, the first five and a half months you're learning remotely, you know. So they, they send you videos you interact with your professors up. online and then at the end of the course you need to fly over there where to do your your practical training in a brewery mm-hmm. and you take your final exam there so you're you so actually was, um, had to pass all these tests and certifications yeah i, I wish i i wish i paid more attention to algebra when i was in college <laughs> but like, i really could have used it yeah i, I thought local was hard mm. the brewing course was changing i have to say <laughs> Like, yeah, so you mentioned how how long was it until you were able to finally sell a batch that you were confident about? I mean, I, you mentioned something earlier, but uh, how long from the start of learning to actually selling? It it took us about a year to to get to the point where we were fairly happy with what we were selling. Mm-hmm. But um, of course, over time, you also make small refinements to your recipes mm-hmm. and also for efficiency to get costs down. Um, I think the beer that we're putting out this year is much, much better than the beer that we were putting out when we first started. It's, it's really a learning process. There's no there's no way around that. You won't get it 100% right so you've at the always, get-go. You've always been fine tweaking. Because um, I know you also release different brews every season. So what we can expect are always uh, things to be getting better with, uh, with, with the stuff that Pedro is releasing. For sure. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so just to backtrack a little, at what point did you actually decide, or was it was it a planned uh, leaving leaving of your nine to five job? Well, at that time, Pedro was really just starting out, no, so it couldn't sustain my family mm-hmm. um, the way we wanted it to. Mm-hmm. No? So the, I had to I had to stay on um, and and retain my job for almost two years. Uh, wow. After we incorporated, yeah, we, we started getting stuff together in 2014. I think I left, I left my job 2016. So it took a good two years before I, I finally took the jump. And even then, uh, it was it was a forced thing because yeah. Nadine was able to transition first. Mm-hmm. She started working with Pedro, mm-hmm. and I kept my job so we would have some security. 
But at 2016, you know, the market was growing. We were starting to move into different outlets. Um, we were quite stretched and things were starting to crack. Mm-hmm. You know, as partners, we talked about it and they told me, Jaime, you really you need to, at least for the next two or so years, come into this full time, get Focus. everything up and running, yeah. right? Focus on this. Mm-hmm. And then once we have the systems in place, then, you know, yeah. we can adjust you can, your yeah. participation. Yeah. So you had a so, sort of an agreement that you can go back to your day job that you had to set up the processes, the systems. I ended up leaving two years after, after we started with Pedro. Okay. And it was kind of a rushed thing. So I had to tell my boss, I said, you know, that brewery that I've been kind of playing around with, <laughs> well, give me to start full time. And they're like, uh, when? And I was like, can I leave in two months? Mm-hmm. And, you know, there were some discussions and it took some time, but I was able to get out. They treated me very well in that in that office. Looks so, like you had a long leash. You were able to start everything. You were able to grow everything. The schedule was kind of flexible because... Mm-hmm. Uh, the US time. Certain days you'd have, call, you'd have calls at three in the morning with the US, or mm-hmm. you'd be dealing with Europe, or you'd be flying to Australia. Mm-hmm. So they didn't really check up on you in the office. In fact, when yeah. I did go to the office because I wanted some quiet, I was the only one sitting there. <laughs> so I, I worked from home mostly. No, yeah, the work was very heavy. I, I don't think now now that that I'm a little bit older and a little bit more worn, I don't know if I could have done the same thing as I did then because. <laughs> I had like 12 hour work days during the week and then in the evenings was planning sessions with my Pedro partners and then the weekend was me at the brewery setting up like pipes and tanks and stuff yeah and then you know on Monday uh, the week just starts again and that that was my that was my life for for those two years of setting up yeah I I was gonna ask actually how you were managing your time and but I guess that's what you're saying. That you're practically managing everything from a Monday to Sunday type of lifestyle. Then, anyway, yeah. not, not, I mean, nothing blew up. I think we were fairly successful in managing mm-hmm. both requirements. But I mean, there were days when I was falling asleep standing up. <laughs> I can imagine, especially yeah. you're tasting the beer, so you you might have you might be dozing off a bit when we were setting up surprisingly we were doing very little drinking just just mm. tasting <laughs> because we were so busy that you needed your energy like nah I yeah. can't hang out in what, what the heck is this of course not I have a work to do yeah. when things started to fall into place and we were able to hire and add to our team so I had an assistant brewer already we had a manager in place um, we started looking at strategically growing our brand mm-hmm. um, and that's where we met yeah. Uh, we looked at venturing into the tap house. Mm-hmm. So it was that transition from um, selling purely packaged beer to opening our own retail a- outlet mm-hmm. where I was able to step away from my production responsibilities and move into like working on more New marketing related initiatives or you know like limited edition brews or going for additional training and you know, Brewers conferences and yeah. things like that. Yeah. So that's where I was able to kind of branch out. I think that's typical of a business. Uh, you know, when you let go of some hats, that's that's when actually things start falling into place more. Focus on expansion. Focus on um, right. different areas, a growth area. I find it interesting that you mentioned that you left your job. More of that, there was momentum coming your way for the business, for the industry. It wasn't that that you got sick of your job already or anything like that. It was really the business growing beyond. Yeah, um, it wasn't that I was unhappy with my work. In fact, I, I liked it. Um, but I I liked the idea of having our own business more, obviously. Now, I wanted to give it some time to grow. Mm-hmm. And if there's one thing that I would tell people who are getting into business, it's, you know, as much as you can, don't leave your day job until you absolutely have to. Yeah, I- and whether you're happy with it, your day job, I mean, that's entirely a different thing from whether you'll be successful with it. <laughs> yeah, so you you have to get to the point where your business can kind of support you, you know, support you, you know. And I I did have to take a, a pay cut, uh, quite a big one, right? I can imagine. But it, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> massive. <laughs> but um, I I was grateful that I, I gave it that, that time to grow, and mm-hmm. the company was in better shape because of it. And I was able to take those two years and make the pit, you know, and, and get get the operations up and running yeah. and then step away and do other things later on. 
when you went full time into Pedro, it still wasn't going to match your finances. So it was really you uh, taking a bigger bet that what you were, you were going to be earning from Pedro would be uh, enough or commensurate in the future. That's that's accurate. Yeah. Yeah. And but uh, but I guess in those two years you were able to ready, maybe psychologically, maybe understand the different sacrifices that you had to make financially and on, on the personal side. A lot, a lot of things happened those two years. We we saw where we fell short. Mm-hmm. Some of our projections weren't accurate. You know, um, you know the reality on the ground is really different from the high level planning. Mm-hmm. And we, we encountered situations like that, you know. We made some mistakes and we had to pivot to a certain extent. Um, but yeah, those two years allowed us to experiment a little bit and, and to move things around and would play with different uh, approaches to marketing and sales. Mm-hmm. And I think it made the company more resilient as a result. It was it was definitely a growing experience for us. Yeah. Uh, in, in those uh, growing stages uh, and up to now, like what's been the what's been the toughest? Uh, COVID aside, what what were the growing pains that that you would say would be the, the the largest challenges that you guys faced? The market the market was non-existent. Mm-hmm. The market for craft beer, other than a few people who were very enthusiastic about it, um, I, I wouldn't say there was really a robust market yeah. when you tell them that this product is better but you need to refrigerate it or you need to store it properly or mm-hmm. you know consume it as quickly as possible you know all their lives but may party sa bahay they go to the garage and they pull out a case of san miguel that was sitting there for six months yeah. in the heat and, it's and that's fine. what they pop up so our product is different you know uh, um part of what makes it so interesting is the freshness but mm-hmm. it takes added steps for you to ensure that that's it freshness is my thing. The other thing that we found uh, difficult was like internally we were all learning by doing because unlike countries like Europe or the US where you have uh, small brewery operations in different towns and you know there's training, there's schools, there are courses that you can take. There's an industry around it. There are specialists who can look at your water, look at your malt provide you with data on your hops you know here it's you're very far away from all that information you know there are very few examples of small uh, micro breweries like the ones that we we set up right and and i think what you've done now you you've mentioned that there wasn't there isn't really that ecosystem that supported the industry and now i think i think there's a healthy local craft beer scene that i've seen you guys like kind of work together and really Try to support one another. Um, I think that's one of the advocacies that you you've gone into, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, we we've, we've done a lot to work together. Um, it's a small community, and they're all very very good guys. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've we've done beer fests together. We've uh, you know supported uh, openings of each other's breweries. Mm-hmm. It starts to feel a little bit like a Ponzi scheme because it, it's like we're buying each other's <laughs> but um, it, it worked I mean it, it worked to help the, to grow it and it got to the point where um, suppliers started to identify the market as having potential and they would come and they would talk to us about hey what new molds do you need hey if I can get my pricing to this with you like um, so these are both local international suppliers that are coming to you guys. Yeah, there's a local craft beer association that we uh, started up. We line up our voices, mm-hmm. and, and it's easier for us to, you know, discuss concerns and help plan events, yeah. things like that. The nice thing is that you can tell that the the industry was growing because the the suppliers started to take notice. They started to identify the Philippines as, as a place with a growing industry. So you could see that that stuff was starting to really come together. Yeah. Come together. Well, up until up until this year when everything fell apart, right? Yeah, but, yeah. Um, <laughs> but we that's were, a different story. <laughs> we, were, we were, I mean, coming into 2020, we were very optimistic about what was happening. Yeah. I guess you're you're really into it more than you know more than a business more than more than just for Pedro. You're really looking after this entire industry more than just being a businessman. You're really in it for the craft. You're really in it for the for the industry that you've started. 
one of the one of the best things about it i mean when you really think about beer uh, there are tons of companies in the world that sell beer mm-hmm. beer's beer but what what distinguishes craft beer and the events that we would organize and you know concerts and parties and stuff is really the the community that we were growing you know the the people who appreciated the product who liked tasting new things who who look forward to new releases who who became close as a group and started hanging out together we enjoyed that a lot we enjoyed that a lot um it made it more than a business made yeah. it more than a business for sure uh, uh you have others to look out for it's the community that you built with uh, with others that's uh that's what's made it special because i was also going to ask um uh, you could have gone back after the two years that, that that you discussed with your partners but you decided not to get get into a corporate job back again so um i assume that's one of the reasons are there other reasons why that you you know you you wanted to just stay in business well personally i i enjoyed the craft beer business mm. but i enjoyed the life of business in itself mm. so Uh, the more I worked at Pedro, the more we also started looking at other business ventures, and mm-hmm. uh, we opened up the tap room. Um, yeah. We invested in another bar. We uh, started looking at different things that uh, that we saw mm-hmm. had some potential. Yeah. Um, some of them were directly related to us being a part of Pedro. I mean, the mm-hmm. opportunities came up because we were in the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, others not so much, but what we learned doing business up until that point definitely helped that's what i could also say uh, from my experience and um that's what i i guess wanted to impart also to our listeners or our viewers that um like what you learn in a business is also applicable to things that you can go into and because now you're you have more time you're you have more you, you have some confidence you can get into different things like you said some are related some are uh, a little left field of what you're already into but um but it's having this time and having that that confidence and expertise that and let you get into new businesses other than what from what you already have yeah once once you step into the entrepreneurial life i think there's no there's no going, going back, back. <laughs> no going back Are right now are you a business businessman first, a brewer second, and a lawyer third, or um, I'm taking a guess as to what hats or what uh, what priorities do you see yourself having? <laughs> now, now I'm I'm biding my time. The pandemic has taken its toll on the FMB business. Yep. Uh, a lot of people are struggling, including mm-hmm. us. Right. Yeah. Um, so we had to step back a little bit, you know, secure what we could secure, mm-hmm. ensure that we stop bleeding, mm-hmm. and make sure that when things get better, we're in, in a decent position to be able to recover. Correct. Right. So uh, that occurred across all of our businesses, and even my law practice. How are you going to build um, client. clients if you can't? You, know, you can't go to city hall. You can't go to <laughs> talk to people. More often than not, they're not there. Mm-hmm. Or Correct. you know, if if they're working from home, then it you know it's it's just hard. It's like you working is difficult on its own, but mm-hmm. this situation presents a lot of stumbling blocks to mm-hmm. to it. So yeah, there's been a there's been a general slowdown. You no, know? mm-hmm. but. I think in in the in the craft beer industry, our communication with our industry peers has been constant. I am some mergers in the future mm-hmm. between certain companies, yeah, right? Makes sense. Some might not survive, some will. Mm-hmm. Some might come out of this stronger. It's hard to tell, but mm-hmm. I think everybody is trying to work together to mm-hmm. to the extent that they can make things better, so that later on, you know, we we all survive. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's what I'm getting from you. Like, I, I kept reiterating that you're you're really looking out for the industry as a whole. Uh, you know, I, I think you see other brands not so much as competitors, but really as colleagues in in growing the industry. I think that's what's great, what's what's magnificent about what you guys have built. And that's that's something that um, is not uncommon. You'd be surprised, like. Uh, The guys from Joe's Brew, great guys. We work together with them. We're working on some things now, mm-hmm. um, and we'll be putting out some beers together in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, June Flores, who who heads our craft beer association, mm-hmm. fantastic guy. 
I mean, his heart is super into it, and he's always in touch with us. The other brewers, they, I mean, they, they don't stop. Mm -hmm. They don't stop. So, um, there are there are a lot of people whose hearts are in this game. Mm -hmm. That's what I've always gotten from you, and that's what you've also communicated tonight. Nah, I think it's something that you wear in your sleeve: your love for the industry, your love for the the craft uh, itself. Uh, I wanted to get, I guess, your advice on what you would tell those uh, wanting to get into business, wanting to leave their jobs, or maybe you have you have a specific message for people who want to get into the craft beer industry. I would say. I would reiterate, don't leave your day job until you absolutely Correct. have to. Mm -hmm. Because that extra cash flow will help you once you jump into your business. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, the planning part is important, but you can't plan for everything. Mm -hmm. We made some mistakes. Learning what I did, I think my advice now, if you're going to set up a business and look at the business model, it's very easy to fixate on what you're doing and think how wonderful it is. Mm -hmm. But you need to step away you need to step away and look at it as if you're a competitor who's mm -hmm. trying to exploit the weak point, the weaknesses in that business. Correct. You know, you need to look at okay, what can go wrong? Where are we weak at? What am I not seeing? Mm -hmm. What have we not planned for? That perspective that you know we've tried our best, but we're not perfect, and we probably screwed something up. Yeah. And looking at it that way is gonna help. So I think it's, it's really gonna help. Trying to dot your T's and cross your eyes, and sorry, I mixed that up. <laughs> dot your, dot your eyes and cross your T's. Eyes and uh, cross your T's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you're asking about craft yeah, brewing. Yeah, craft beer. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> if you want to get into it now, it's probably one of the toughest times in history to get, other than the prohibition, to get into <laughs> brewing some kind of um, al alcoholic beverage, but. Um, my advice would be uh, start small, keep your overhead low. If you can, if you do it out of your house initially, you know, small batches, 50, 60 liters. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be where to start uh, because foreigner sales are starting to move, uh, starting to move to uh, home consumption, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, delivery. So you don't need to start out with a massive brewery that's going to stop. Supermarkets, right? right? You you can start uh, relatively small, build your name, and then you can grow it organically as mm -hmm. as things get better. I think yeah, I think that's uh, that's something that would be brewers would appreciate. And yeah, it's an in, it's an interesting interesting time to get into it because the uh, different factors, different things working out right now, uh, different challenges also. But um, yeah, we appreciate that. And then uh, last thing, where our viewers, our listeners can uh, can buy Pedro now during the pandemic. Yeah, so check out our Facebook page and our Insta Instagram page there. We have um, our order instructions and the menu of variants there and we update that every week. So we're looking at trying to keep the variants rolling so the, you know, we, there's always something new to try. So we're working that out so that weekly we have some, we have some new stuff to offer. And you can message directly on the on the Facebook page, mm -hmm. and the the numbers are also there to call. So, so yeah, so uh, okay. thanks for joining me today, Aim, and um, I hope uh, everything works out uh, with Pedro continuing to grow. And anything else that you want to share with our viewers? Stay healthy. <laughs> Drink your vitamins. <laughs> be kind to people. <laughs> and drink your beer. <laughs> Just drink, drink moderately. Okay. All right. So, thanks, Aime. So.